In the beginning, there was the British and European Grand Prix at Silverstone. The race was staged in the presence of over 180,000 spectators and the King and Queen of the United Kingdom. It was the biggest single sporting event ever staged in England. It was the first FIA Formula One World Championship Grand Prix. And it was painted Italian racing red. The racing red of the factory Alfa Romeo team and its drivers, the famous three Fs, Juan Manuel Fangio, Giuseppe Farina, and Luigi Fagioli. And for Silverstone only, for the doughty Englishman, Reg Parnell. The soundtrack of the race was the scream of the 1.5 litre straight eight, two stage supercharged Alfa Romeo engines. The aroma was of alcohol laced fuel and burning Pirelli rubber. Alfa Romeo, based in Milano, came out of retirement in 1950, dusting off the Alfettas that had remained hidden in nearby farmland during World War II. Meanwhile, Enzo Ferrari, who had managed the Alfa team preceding the war, in the decade preceding the war, had built his own cars for 1950, for drivers Alberto Ascari and Luigi Villarese. However, for the first all-important World Championship Grand Prix, Enzo Ferrari failed to come to financial terms with the BRDC, the British Racing Drivers Club, and so didn't compete at Silverstone. Alpha's opposition, therefore, was limited to the French Gordini and Lago Taubos, to the Italian Maseratis, and to the British ERAs. The definitive race, of course, was between the Alpha drivers themselves. But the event at Silverstone on Saturday, May 13, 1950, was much more than a motor race. Fans shrugged off the war-tainted 1940s by driving, training, riding, hitchhiking, and in many cases walking to Silverstone to watch a British and European Grand Prix that marked the first round of the new FIA Formula One World Drivers' Championship. Points would be awarded down to fifth place with an additional point for fastest lap. The sport had known European and national championships before the war. This was the start of a new world championship a series that would elevate Formula One to new levels of global acclaim. The flags of the nations frame a scene of intense activity on an airfield near Silverstone in Northamptonshire this bright May morning. Here on this British motor racing circuit, the world's leading aces with their supercars, mobile workshops, team managers, mechanics and all the paraphernalia which must accompany them are preparing for the greatest of all races, the Grand Prix d'Europe. They are here from Italy, France, Switzerland, Belgium, Siam, Era, and the Argentine, and of course Great Britain. It's a great and colourful day for British motorsport. This year, the Royal Automobile Club has been granted the honour of organising this Battle of the Giants, the first time ever that the title has been permitted to leave France or Italy. In the paddock, mechanics and even the drivers give the final touches to the cars, while in the shade of the marquees, a suitable welcome is prepared for the vast concourse of 100,000 people who will attend the race. It's a great motorist's get-together day, a day for parties, official and private. We look in for a moment at a cocktail party given by the Guild of Motoring Writers to the foreign press and officials. Colonel F. Stanley Barnes, clerk of the course, slips in to meet old friends. As does John Cobb, holder of the world's land speed record. We pick out that internationally famous figure, Earl Howe, wearing his customary cap. Others are doing themselves rather well in the food line, but while some eat and drink, the preparatory work must continue. There are the finishing touches to be applied to the stands and the scoreboards. In the paddock, where the competitors are waiting, we catch a glimpse of Bob Gerrard, one of Britain's leading drivers, discussing with his wife, Joan, plans for the race. Cuthbert Harrison, another fine ERA driver, wonders, it seems, what he should wear. The Alfa Romeo mechanics and team manager are now able to relax and smile, but only temporarily after their labours. One mechanic sends a postcard home, and greatly impressed he is by the mobile post office, which is so handily placed. But now the time draws near for the cars to be on the course. Here is France's only hope in Grand Prix racing, the big four and a half litre unsupercharged Talbo, so much larger and heavier than the Type 158 Alfa Romeos of one and a half litres and with two stage supercharging. On the evidence of past form, the eight-cylinder Alphas are the fastest cars of post-war racing. They are the leading attraction today. And the spectators, they have been streaming in like this, by coach, car, motorcycle, push bike, and on foot, since early morning, to take up their vantage points all round the 2.8 miles course. Press officer Dudley Noble is harassed by all and sundry from the nation's newspapers. I'm sorry, old chap, but there is just not a single track pass left. 
An early arrival is the chairman of the Guild of Motoring Writers, Basil Cardew, who discusses the race with Earl Howe. It was Giuseppe Farina, 44, who qualified on the pole at Silverstone. Nino Farina, the patrician nephew of Pinin Farina, the Italian coach builder of enormous repute. Also the understudy of Tazio Nuvolari, the pre-war Italian racing hero. Giuseppe Farina was also known, however, for his aggression in the cockpit against other drivers on track. He lived a debonair, very impressive lifestyle, but he was known in the racing context perhaps most of all for his driving position, almost straight arm, relaxed, one that belied the very heavy steering of the front engine, Alfetta, but certainly one that caught the eye of a young British Formula 3 driver at Silverstone in 1950, a driver called Sterling Moss, who later modelled his style, his driving position, on that of Farina. With his light blue overalls, his white cloth cap, Farina was every bit the Italian racing hero. Next to Farina on the grid was the 52-year-old Italian Luigi Fagioli, the Abruzzi robber from the south of Italy. He'd been brilliant pre-war, drove uniquely for Auto Union and Mercedes, Ferrari and Maserati too, won the 35 Monaco Grand Prix. But by the time he came to Silverstone in 1950, he hadn't driven a racing car since 1936. Despite that 14-year layoff, he was quick out of the box. Alongside him, in light blue polo shirt and matching cloth cap was a mercurial Juan Manuel Fangio, aged 39 and enjoying his second full season of racing in Europe. When he'd first been announced as a driver for Alfa Romeo, the Italian press had been a little bit hostile. Fangio had quietly replied, well, my father's Italian, and then he'd gone out to win the San Remo Grand Prix in the wet, scoring a decisive win over the opposition. From then on, Fangio became a hero of the Italian racing public. Excitement builds up as the cars leave the paddock for the pits. There goes number 11, Harrison's pre-war ERA, impeccably prepared as usual. There are still last-minute adjustments to be carried out as the cars take up their positions in front of their pits. Number 23 is the British one-and-a-half-litre four-cylinder Alta, built by that great enthusiast Geoffrey Taylor. The driver's nerves are taut, but they hide it well. These last few minutes before they go up to the starting line are the most nerve-wracking of all. Baron de Graffenried can even perform a happy jig for the benefit of Bera, the Siamese prince, who is also driving a Maserati. Then the crowd's attention is suddenly diverted from the activity in the pit area. Their Majesties the King and Queen, accompanied by Princess Margaret and Lord and Lady Mountbatten, have arrived on the course. It is the first time the reigning sovereign has attended a motor race in Great Britain. The drivers are presented to the royal party. The Queen chats with Baron de Graffenried. Princess Margaret asks Bera what his chances are against the all-powerful Italian team. The crowds cheer as the royal party walks back to the royal box where are waiting the representatives of the national motoring organizations of France, Italy, the Argentine, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Portugal, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United States of America, all here as guests of the Royal Automobile Club. The Royal Standard flies over the course as the drivers return to their cars and officials begin to clear the course. From the start line between Abbey Curve and Woodcote, and opposite a huge grandstand on the site of today's Silverstone Heritage Centre, the new Formula One World Championship was underway. Smile Direct Club. These are Smile Direct Club aligners. They're laser cut for comfort to gently straighten teeth under a dentist's direction. They can turn a smile like this into a smile like this in as little as four to six months. So choose fast. Choose smart. Choose smile. Start from home. Visit smiledirectclub.co.uk. Hey, hey, hey. Dan? Dan, so the, the great thing about the purple bricks app is that you can see exactly what viewers think about your house. We also do towels. It's purple. If 
Do you mind if we use it just... Purple Bricks, official estate agent of Team GB. Oh, no. Ruby thought that squirrel on a new flat screen team.